It's Tuesday, April 14th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we talk about spooky games. Let's do this. Being home, not working. I'm, well, not working at an official job with a uh, where I have to file a, a W-2 and such. But instead, uh, working hard at uh, being a bum? I'm working hard at actual stuff. I do lo- I'm doing a lot of stuff. Anyway. Bum-related things? One of the things that, you know, and even if you're working hard on real stuff... You can't do it all day. You got to, you know, even the hardest working workaholic person has to take a little break, you know, whether it's a watch a little TV, read a little book, you know, something to, to ease the mind. So I've been playing uh, Earthbound in the emulator. Now, have you, you've beaten Earthbound, I assume. Yeah, a long past. time ago, once on an how, emulator. How long has it been? Is it long enough to where you don't remember all the little details? I don't remember the details. I only remember the generic parts. You know, the, 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 the fundamental facts. I don't, you know, the small thing. Like, I don't remember individual dialogues and things like that. Um, anyway, but yeah, I've been, I've been playing it again. It, I think it's kind of weird how when I had a job, like, I mean, Earthbound is, uh, you know, a Japanese-style RPG at its, at its core, even though the rest of it is sort of not you know, anything well, like you know, it's a like, Final Fantasy game. It's like a comedy game, and there's a lot of interesting elements. Yeah. I just think funny. it's... Well, first of all, I want to point out, isn't it weird how, like, there's so, mo- the vast majority of Japanese-style RPG-type games are fantasy-slash-sci-fi, one or the other, or both, and, like, so few are not, <laughs> and Earthbound is, like, just one of the ones that isn't, you know? Well, because you had Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy, and that just kind yeah, of... Uh, the- yeah, that's it, right? So... First of all, it's not fantasy. I guess it's kind of sci-fi. All right, it's a kid with psychic powers going around saving the world from, from various aliens, things. From aliens and monsters with a, with a baseball bat. Right, anyway. But that aside, perfectly realistic. But yeah, it's weird how now that I don't have a job, like, suddenly RPGs are tolerable. <laughs> At least a little bit more tolerable than they used to be. I don't know... It, I think it's how tolerable a time-wasting game is is directly a function of how much time you have to waste. Well, by the same token, uh, you know, I'm playing through Chrono Trigger again, and I'm also in that situation where I don't remember a lot of the details, and but every time I find something in the game, like, it all comes back, and I'm remembering how much I love that game. Well, I think what it was is, you know, back in the day when I had time for RPGs, the thing that frustrated me was random encounters, right? And I'd like to point out that Chrono Trigger and Earthbound... Of, of all JRPGs are some of the best at the way they handle the random encounter, right? Because they still have them. They're, they're there. They have but... them, right? But Earthbound and Chrono Trigger, first of all, it's not random like you're walking around the map and suddenly there's bad guys. It's you see the bad guys on the screen. You can sort of run away from them or try to, or you can sort of sneak up on them and get them from behind for a sneak attack. Or if they sneak up behind you, you get sneak attacked, right? And also... Earthbound has the best thing in the world, which is if you bump into a bad guy who's just so weak that you can't, they can't possibly hurt you, they just die and you get the experience and you don't even have to do the fight. And that's that's pretty great. Um, I wish the threshold had been a little higher. The threshold, I believe, is they couldn't possibly do any damage well, to actually, you. Yeah, that's true. But actually, it's surprising like how sometimes you know a bad guy you'll bump into, you'll think you have to fight it, but then it just dies. You're like, oh, yeah, sweet. <laughs> like You'll even level up because of it. You'll get so much experience. Another thing is usually when you beat a boss in an area, they'll make you walk out back the way you came in sometimes. But... When they do that, um, all the bad guys like be running away from you, or they'll all be gone, which is pretty awesome. It's weird though. I I often would be very miffed when I had to walk out of something, but yeah. I, like Final Fantasy did that well. You well, always... you can use if you have an exit mouse or uh, you know whatever. But like remember Final Fantasy, you if you beat the fiends, they would teleport you right back out, and when you beat Garland, they teleport you right back out. Yep. But. When you hike into that goddamn cave to get the floater or something, you had to hike all the way back out. Yeah, it's and if you didn't, but it, it was this odyssey. It's like you had to get in, get the thing, and get out without dying, yeah. or it was all for naught. I think, you know, so I think the fact that those things are made, you know, easier is part of the reason I can continue to play Earthbound. But I think another reason I can continue to play it is that I'm in an emulator. So I can do the save and load state, which helps a lot, right? Um,. And I could do a lot of cheating tricks with that. For example, I can go to the guy who sells hints, 
save, talk, get a hint for $75, then load and get my money back. I see you play money-making game. I play money-making game, indeed. Old men run money-making game, I'll but also, Scott always wins. I'll also do other things, such as save the game, get into a fight, use the spy ability to figure out what the bad guy's weaknesses are, ah. load, then do it again, and, and so that I, you know, can instead of wasting an action on yeah, spy, yeah, I can waste, spend you know, that action on doing damage. You know what else would do that? Cheating. Game facts. Game genie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and something else uh, I think that makes the game a lot more tolerable and isn't necessarily cheating is I'm using an Xbox 360 controller to play this game, right? So I only really need... The D-pad, the four button, the four face buttons, LR, and start and select, right? So I've got a lot of extra buttons going on. Uh, so what I did is I took R2, and I bound R2 to speed up the emulator. So I can walk real fast. I don't need to use, like, a skip sandwich, you know? I can just... Or, like, if there's a guy who's got a really long dialogue that's annoying, I'll just hold down R2 while pushing the button to speed through the dialogue real quick. Uh, like, remember, when the Fuzzy Pickles guy comes up, comes down, I'll make him go away in, like, two seconds. <laughs> I remember I, I had that for my SNES emulator when I was working at It IBM, is an SNES emulator. But I didn't have it for my NES emulator. Uh, so as a result, I would play games, and I got so used to the speed up that... I would hit it when I was playing NES games, and it wouldn't do anything, and I'd get so frustrated, I'd just quit right then and there. Yeah, but it's like, you know, when I'm, instead of wasting, you know, like, 30 seconds r walking down, like, this street, I'll walk down the street in, like, three seconds. You know what game could have used that? You know what game would have would have been a thousand times better if a I could have done that? You, a game where you walk really, really slow? Pokemon. Yeah, Pokemon for oh, sure. Oh, my God. Forget the bicycle, whoosh. Who needs that? <laughs> or, in fact, get on the bicycle. Yeah, you go even faster. Mm -hmm. Whoosh! <laughs> uh, it's good. But I think I heard that too. Pokemon Platinum actually has faster combat. Thank the gods. Of course, little, too little, too late. Yeah. I like your strategy of always buy the second yeah. Pokemon game. It's like I regret buying Diamond. I should have just waited and bought the Platinum one. I should have known they were going to do it. So next time, I'm just going to buy the Platinum equivalent next time. You can buy it and then buy it. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. All right. But yeah, Earthbound. If you haven't played Earthbound, That's I mean, a good game. normally we're anti of that kind of RPG. You know, it's called RPG, but it really shouldn't be. Well, Earthbound or Mother is one of those exceptions yeah. where it's it's like... Well, Mother is 1 is the NES game. Really, you you shouldn't play that whole game. It's not worth it. It's too much. It's it's just... It's, it's worth playing the beginning. Well, the it's very, worth, very beginning. Just play it to see what it was like. Don't actually play it to win. You know, just play it to see what the game was about, what, how it worked, etc. Right? Earthbound or Mother 2 as it is known in Japan. Play that entire game and then I have the Mother 3 fan translation ah, nah, in a GBA em emulator. So I'm going to play that when uh, I'm done with uh, Earthbound but slash Mother 2. But you know, I'm thinking one of the reasons I feel like Chrono Trigger is tolerable to me even though I have a job and it's not just nostalgia is that I mostly play it when I'm idle, like on the train or like some place when I'm waiting for something or doing anything like that, primarily on the train. Mm -hmm. So whenever I play a game like that at home, I feel like I should be doing something because I should be doing something. That's I got to right. finish that e-commerce. I got all the You got a lot of shit you didn't do. Yeah, well, I've been busy. Unlike you, I have a job. What are you talking about? I'm doing so much shit. You have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, you know working. What I did today. I did more today than I've done like in a long time. Yeah, I, I did a lot too. Uh -huh. But anyway... On the train, or if I were jobless, let's say, <laughs> I wouldn't feel this need to be doing something. Kind of like in Wildwood when we go to the beach. I feel relax. a need to be doing something now more than ever. But see, when I like when I'm at the beach, I don't think, oh, I could be working on Geek Nights or oh, no, I gotta do true. this at or I gotta beach. do that. I think, ah. Uh... Yeah, at the beach, I could definitely... I mean, think about it. Most of my Pokemon playing was down in the Wildwood days. Remember that? I remember that. I remember I was. we were all playing It was perfectly Pokemon. okay to just push, sit there pushing A for a few hours when you're at the beach. You got nothing else doing. Why not push A? At one point, I was watching something on TV, playing Pokemon with one hand, and playing Civ Four on the laptop at the same time. Oh, that's a good time. That was a real good time. All right. But... Uh, the, you all should know this is coming. We've talked about it. Everyone's talked about it, but it's been street dated. The uh, Wii Motion and Wii Sports Resort. 
We forgot all about that thing. I don't yeah. even know what's going on in the Wii. It's been so long since I even turned it on or played it that I have, I have no idea what's going on on the Wii or anything. I haven't played a non-virtual console game in I don't know months. what Wii games are coming out. I don't know what Wii games are out. I mean, they announced the Wii Motion, and, and then I, like, I completely forgot about it. <laughs> and now it's they're actually releasing it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, when that thing. When did they announce that? It's going to be available on June 8th. All right. For 20 bucks. All right, not buying it, probably. As people pointed out, if you buy four Wiimotes, four Wiimotions, and four Nunchucks, that's basically a PS3. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Nintendo has always, always been about the accessories. Trying to sell you power pads, trying to sell you power gloves, trying to sell you memory cards, trying to sell you memory expansion cards for your Nintendo 64. The, the Nintendo 64, you know why they made four controller slots? Not because they thought four-player gaming would be fun. So they could sell you three controllers instead of just one more controller. Remember right? when they did that on the NES? On the there NES, was the, the they, would, score and they the... would sell you a four-score. They'd sell you an NES Advantage. They would sell you an NES Max. They'd sell you a Zapper, right? You know, that was that's what Nintendo's been about. And that's always where the money is. The margins on accessories are ginormous compared to the margins on games and consoles. Well, I wouldn't use the word ginormous. because Ginormous. It's, because it's not a fucking word. <laughs> Gi- I mean, the Wii Motion probably cost them like a dollar or two to make. I what mean, I wonder is, didn't there are only two options here. Either Nintendo originally said, you know, thought we're going to make the Wii. And then someone in engineering said, we can't get it as accurate as you guys promised in time. So why don't we split off the accurate thing and we'll release it as is, it's good enough, and then we'll release this bundle later. Or they said, we could make it more accurate now. Or we could charge $19.99, mega time, mega team, mega toe, mega two. <laughs> it was fun. I'm not sure what the situation was. I would not discount any of these reasonable explanations that we can come up with. It could be any one of them. But what's interesting is the reports when this first first came out and there were demos for some reporters and everything was that it wasn't any different. And I kind of expected that. But now there are reports coming out that it's actually a lot different. I mean, someone I think at EA said it's too precise. Like, it's it's exactly one-to-one. Like, the fidgeting of your hand is picked up by this thing. Which is And that they have, to, they have to decrease the sensitivity on it in order to actually make the game playable. No, no, no. All, they, all that means is that they, need, they can make better kinds of games. Uh, hopefully. We don't... Well, but, no, but you're going to trust what some guy at EA says. I, you know, it's like, I need to I need to experience this probably at a PAX demo uh, station. See, there, there are two very important eras in RIM's gaming life. I'll call them the pre and the post. The AD and the BC. Before WarioWare Smooth Moves came out <laughs> and after <laughs> WarioWare Smooth Moves came out. Because that was when the dream died. You know, that game would have been just fine if the multiplayer had good modes. You wouldn't the Wii part wouldn't have mattered. No, it wouldn't have, but you know what? They booched the only part of the game, the series, the entire franchise well, you know that what? was ever good. The part, the game where you catch the things and like, sort of hold them up is, is okay. It was but... a great $5 mini game. Yes, it was. Was not a great... Not even $5, $1. 50 cents. Didn't I, I sold the game, I think. I think you did. On Amazon, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't or did the, I? I don't remember. It wasn't the worst game on the Wii. I mean, remember uh, that Monkey Ball? Yeah, I sold that definitely on Amazon. That was possibly the worst game ever made. But you know what? Actually, thinking back, right, at, at all the Wii games that we, because we've got quite a few Wii games. You know what Wii games I played the most? I played. Uh, let's see, Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Well, I mean, Wii games, actual games on discs for the Wii. Uh, the tennis. No, that was GameCube. Yeah. Ah. Uh, you know what games I played the most for the Wii? F Zero. Well, the. No, no GameCube, that was a GameCube huh? game. Yeah. Huh. You know what games I played the most of the way? What game? Well, the Zelda game comes in second place. The Metroid game comes but in third the place. The Zelda game was a GameCube game. That's true. They just, re- they just made it on the way. That's Wii, true. So, so, that doesn't count. so, okay. The Metroid game was in second place. You know what the, the game I played the most? Uh, Excite Truck. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Excite Truck is actually really good looking back on it. You know, I mean, I and I think this, they're making like. Something else. They're making like some sort of monster thing where like you drive creatures around. I don't know what they're doing. It's like excite something else they're doing. I don't know, but whatever. It's just 
looking back on that, it's like, huh, really? Wow. Mm. Honestly. Yeah, honestly. I but played Excite Truck the most. Before Wario wears smooth moves, which I kind of, what that really entails is when I realize that Nintendo will never allow any of its platforms to achieve what they could possibly achieve. Yep. I mean, back in the Crystal Chronicles day when they tried, I, all I could think was that this is it. Nintendo has proven that they can do something awesome and different. But what Nintendo <laughs> saw was everyone hated that game. Well, I think what happened, right, is that the GameCube, right, the GameCube was actually kind of awesome, right? But the thing is, is people don't care about good gameplay, and that's why Miyamoto was sad in the GameCube era, right? Because people didn't care about I the awesome gameplay. I think we already did an entire show on this topic. Right. So people were buying PlayStation 2s, which had quantity and not so much quality. Well, they had quality there, too, but a lot of quantity, more, more so. So when the Wii came around, people like us were psyched up for it because it was like, wow, we're going to get all the awesome games that like the GameCube had only on this Wii with this motion stuff. It's going to be awesome. But they, they dropped the quality of the GameCube games by the wayside when they made the Wii. And that's why the Wii is sitting there not being played. But so pre WarioWare Smooth Moves Rim would have said, now they can make the freaking Star Wars lightsaber game. And it'll be the best game ever. But now, <laughs> what I know is going. What I what I predict is that they're going to make a bunch of very uninspired Wii Sports clones. One or two people are going to make games that use this thing, and then it's just going to completely disappear. That's right. And all the fanboys will have bought one, and all the grandmas will have bought one because now they can play the next Wii Sports game. Maybe. And that's it. That. That's it. I, like I. I've basically given up on Nintendo unless they prove to me, unless they try to make another Crystal Chronicles. Yeah. Well, I did, they did. Well, but there is that, one for the Wii, isn't there? I have no son, and there was no sequel to Crystal Chronicles. No, I'm pretty sure there's a new I one for the Wii. I have no son. No, I'm pretty sure there's a new one for the Wii. Yeah, and when's it coming? I think it's out right now. And did it integrate the uh, DS? I think it did. Did it? Yeah, I don't, I don't. I didn't pay attention because I'm not on a job. I can't buy it. But you can go investigate it after the show. I'm highly dubious of this. Go investigate. I heard. Any, anyway. I heard Game and Tyco talking about it. Uh huh. I'm. I'm just. I'm very leery. All right. So I got. I got a news here. Right? Oh, do you? So apparently, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole story here. You can read the story in this blog posting. Uh, but basically. There was a, a sequel to Punch Out that was being made at some point that was going to be called Mike Tyson's Power Punch, right? And in the game, you actually played as Mike Tyson, and Don King was there instead of you know uh, Doc, whatever. Oh, but but Little Mac. I know Little Mac wasn't in this game, um, but you know for reasons uh, pertaining to Mike Tyson and other things, this game was not made. Uh, a game called Power Punch Two was released. But that game did not involve Mike Tyson in any way. And it was also terrible. Of course, Mike Tyson's Power Punch was also terrible. Uh, Power Punch, Mike Tyson's Power Punch is a game where Mike Tyson punches aliens. Much like that episode of Dexter's Lab where with Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh my God. All right, Scott, I got to interrupt and you. And Monkey. I have to interrupt in the middle. Uh, the Wii version <laughs> of Crystal Chronicles is almost identical to that. The, the, the DS Oh, you abortion. looked it up already? Yes. Okay. Quote, the Wii version of the game contains all of the major elements of the DS version. Oh, God. It's just, is it a port? Comma, but must be played on a single screen, period, uh. to compensate. This version has two adjustable in-game fucking screens. Uh. There's no integration with the DS listed here. Uh, this is bullshit. Oh my god, I thought it was a new game. It's just the DS game for the Wii? The fact that they just give you a split screen, I guess? Oh, fuck that. Wow. 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 Honestly? Okay, anyway. Okay. So this Power Punch game, um, basically some collector had it, right? Um, and the community had to get $1,500 together to get the dude to give the game up so that they could rip a ROM and share the ROM with the world. And so I want to, you know, the news is you can go get this ROM and play it of this terrible old game that's actually historically significant, even though it's terrible. Um, but 
I want to start a discussion. I don't want to have the discussion right now. I just want to pose this question out there. Maybe we'll discuss it later, right? Nah. Let's say I had a Van Gogh, some historically significant piece of artwork, right? Yep, yep. It was very important. Yep. And we had the technological capability to, like, perfectly duplicate this historic piece of work, you know, atom by atom, right? Would And there was only one of them in the world left, right? Say the Mona Lisa, right? Would we not be, you know, morally like required to use that technology to make a duplicate, you know, for this historically significant thing, right? So these collectors who are like holding these games, you know, that that they have the only copy in the known universe, we have the technology to perfectly duplicate them and they're just not giving them up. I think that there's that's a serious a serious problem. And it need we need to do something about it. Because it's not can't cool. say that I disagree. I yeah. I would love to play this game. Well, you can. It's a free ROM now. Yes. <laughs> okay, anyway. We need to get it out there more. Well, it's it's out there. You can go download it on the internet. But how many people know about it, except for all of you now who just heard it? About was it was on Kotaku. <laughs> Plenty uh, of people know about it. You know, I, I feel like not that many of our readers read things like Kotaku or College Humor. I know, right? Maybe, so, maybe you should, because that's where we get our news and things yeah, of the day. <laughs> pretty much like 80% of them. Yeah, all right. And the rest are from Slashdot. Yeah, so uh, go ahead. <laughs> With your news. I already did my news. Oh, that was your news. Okay. So then I guess it's time for things of the day. All right. This thing of the day is so epically fucking amazing. Oh, is it? Holy shit. All right. Let's so, it. so, um, this is a video, right? The story is in 1993, 1993, when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 11 years old. Uh, Dan Linton, a guy who ran a BBS called Software Creations, went to Tejas. And in, his, in Tejas, he went to id Software, which is where they made Wolfenstein and Doom and everything, right? Wolfenstein. Wolfenstein. Steen. Goldberg. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, Wolfenstein came out before 1993, but Doom came out in 93 or 94. So this was, this video was taken... Before Doom was finished and released. Before Doom 1 was finished and released, right? And it's a kind of a long video that John Romero has posted on uh, Vimeo here. Um, but this video, you should watch the whole thing and pay attention to every minute of it because it is, like, epically historic and amazing. And, I mean, the main things you got to get out of this video, if you get nothing else, right, is that you watch in this video, the people at id Software... Early in the video, they're playing Aladdin for the Sega Genesis, which just came out. So that was like a top-of-the-line game, right, at this point in time. And that game was pretty good. But then you compare that top-of-the-line game, Aladdin for the Sega Genesis, which is actually a really good game. It is. Um, and compare that to the unfinished Doom that is using, that is not even, that is still using sound effects from the Super Nintendo Wolfenstein, right? This is probably, I, did, I didn't watch the whole video. Did they shoot a BFG? I don't know, but because the BFG used to use different uh, mechanics and they had to change it. Yeah. But I have a whole story. But I mean, that. you watch this video of John Romero demonstrating Doom and then having like one of the first death matches in all of history, right? With one of the other guys that did software while this guy is videoing it, and I mean, you learn that the I mean nowadays the Doom is not so amazing, right? Um, and you know you think of Doom as this historic FPS, but really. The gap between Doom and all the other games at the time Doom came out was just so enormous. I think Doom... And no other game has had that kind of gap, ever. I mean, it, there, there are definitely better games than Doom. And, I, I mean, Doom is great. And amazing but games have come games. out. Like, Quake 2 was a gigantic, like, revolution in gaming. And Half-Life was a gigantic revolution in FPSing and all these sorts of things. But, and you know, Mario 64 yes. and 3D platformers. But the gap between Half-Life and the other games that were out at the time was not nearly as big as the gap between Doom and the other games that came out at that time. I would argue that Doom was possibly the biggest leap in gaming technology. The biggest individual ever. leap ever. In, in the history of gaming. By, I think it was by the, orders of magnitude. Like, I mean, looking at the games that I was playing... When I then got the shareware of Doom. I mean, you look at this video and they're talking about like Commander Keen and shit, and then the guy whips out Doom. 
It's like, holy fuck. And there are things in Doom that you don't even notice nowadays that you don't realize how amazing they were. Like the fact that there was areas where lights turned on and off. Yeah, dynamic lighting in 1993. Or the fact that it actually really looked 3D and you could go up and down in real time smoothly. I mean, Quake 2 was this gigantic leap, and Quake 2 is the game... The fact that bad guys would start shooting each other? I credit Quake 2 with beginning the true modern 3D FPS era. But it wasn't that big of a leap. Well, it was a big leap from Doom, but there was that pesky Quake 1 in between. (laughs) Yeah, that sort of did the in-between leap. Yeah. Doom was just, like, no game has ever Mm. been that amazing compared to the other contemporary games. You really, if you don't get it, you need to watch this video and watch it carefully and sl- watch the whole thing slowly and carefully and let it sink in how much of a leap Doom was in its day. So, uh, completely not along those lines and not related at all. I use this on a Tuesday as opposed to a Wednesday, Partly because I'm sure a lot of the Wednesday listeners already see this sort of stuff all the time, but I feel I should spread it. I don't think I, I'm not going to explain who Hatsune Miku is. You can you can look online and figure that out. Miku Miku. But uh, we're fans, and as long as she doesn't go all Macross on us, I was just about to say. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if she does, that's I'm I can't really falter for it. Nah, there's not much you can do about it anyway. Nah. <laughs> well, you can crash a plane. And you do don't it, have I guess. a trans. You don't have a transforming plane. <laughs> Anyway, I could take my one of my Ring Raiders. It's not going to work. And take it into the monitor. It'll just get owned. <laughs> anyway, so the long story short is that there's an old 60s duet by these cool Japanese Oh, you're using this. Oh. Yeah. And if you look in the more info on this video, there's a link to that movie. And this was redone by another set of Japanese twins more recently. I don't think they, the, the more recent ones were twins. Well, they're, they're, they're similar looking, and they're cute. Yeah. That, that's, that's all that really matters. Okay. So this has been taken to the third degree, and someone has made an animated Miku dance to this song, and I don't just watch it. I don't think I need to say anything yeah, else. Yeah, watch all these, like, there's three or four videos. Just watch all of them, and you'll understand what happened. It's, it's cute, it's cool, and I really, really, really like this song. I was going to say, the song's pretty awesome. It is. And <laughs> catchy and such. Both the modern Especially, remake, I mean, considering it's a Japanese song from the 60s, and it's awesome now, that's pretty epic. Hey, Japanese music from the 60s is awesome. I didn't either. say it wasn't, but I'm just saying, <laughs> considering that, the fact that this song is, like, so awesome now is... is as you know, it's a pretty damn good song. The remake is good, but so is the original. Yeah. And it, it's really cute. Okay. That's all I got. So, all right. We're going to talk about scary games. Oh, spooky games. So basically the which idea. Is boo. Which is boo. Which is boo. Which is boo is scary. Um, hey, so, wait, wait, Scott, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, well, it's about which is boo. <laughs> I, I was going to say. <laughs> uh, um, so basically, the th- it's sort of come up that like you know games aren't scary. Even games that want to be scary. I mean, maybe other people are scared by them, but we definitely aren't. You know, games like Eternal Darkness, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, these sort of games that are supposed to be scary are not scary. Not at least not to us. And if now, you're you're scared by them, you're a sissy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> see, all these games are different. Like Resident Evil went through this long evolution from what it was to what is basically a third-person zombie shooter. Yeah. I actually like Resident I, Evil 4 more than I like the older ones. I yeah. But I haven't played 5, but I'd like to. But that's, it's a third-person shooter. Yeah, it is. But then there's games like Fatal Frame, which I would argue were a lot more scary. I know. I didn't play that, so I don't know. I only played it a little. I, I played most of Fatal Frame vicariously watching other people play it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never played that one. Which is kind of how I enjoy those games. I never really liked yeah. playing them. Right. But the thing is, is like all these games that are supposed to be scary now, I mean, occasionally, like they're, like the first time I played Eternal Darkness, there were a couple parts that were jump out, boo, surprise. Like, boo, there's a body in the bloody bathtub. But it I, wasn't, that was the example. But it wasn't scary. You know, I wasn't like, ew, or... or you know, I didn't feel fear. I just, just like, oh, I jumped a little bit because it went boo, right? And that's not scary. That's just boo. So I realized that sort of like I was scared of video games way back in the day. Like, for example, I think nothing has scared me as much as like the last level of Zelda 1. But I was also scared by like the entire second half or more than the vast majority of Zelda 2 and like towards the end of Mega Man 2 I was getting a little scared when I was a little kid at least you know and 
It's like these old NES games are scarier and still are scary. A lot of these games that try to be scary. And I think there's a discussion to be had just in general about like what make games scary, why why one game's scary and one isn't, how to make a game scarier, et cetera. Well, I think we really need to break out because there are many different kinds of fear. And I, I yep. think for the purposes of a gaming discussion, there are three. The first one, obvious, is the startle, the jump out and boo, the yeah. I look in the bathtub, there's nothing, I see, look I back, even, there's a bloody yeah, body. See, I don't even think that counts as scary I'm or counting fear it, or anything. Because in, in video gaming, that is definitely, it can be used to scare, and it, there is an element of fear. It's just, it's a different kind of fear, and it, I think it can be used effectively. I think it's usually um, overdone. I think a lot of maybe. games that try to be scary end up just being full of boo. Yeah. yeah. Maybe so, but uh, personally, uh, when, you know, the boo feeling is nothing like a fear feeling for me, so I sort of like, I when I, when people make things, they call them scary, and they're actually just boo, I sort of like, no, you're not actually scary, you're just boo, that's, that's not, you're, you're cheating, it's not the same but thing. But see, I think for the purposes of this discussion, that it really fits. Yeah. I think it's one of the three kinds of scaring, startling fear, you know, it's an aspect of this kind of game. Um, it is an aspect of the kind of game, but I think it's not scary. I... I would say it definitely counts. It's, it's one uh, of the three pillars of scary. Well, it doesn't scare me. Well, maybe this is a non, no true Scotsman situation, but <laughs> possibly. I'm anyway. pretty sure it falls in the realm of scaring. Uh, Startle is just another kind of scare. Uh, it has a different reaction. I, I guess the point I'm trying to make that you keep desperately trying to derail with your semantic bullshit is that there are different kinds of fear, different kinds of scaring, and different sorts of feelings you can evoke along these lines but I feel like most game designers don't necessarily differentiate between them and just kind of make games with these stereotypical things that they that should be scary. And sometimes they touch on the elements of one kind of fear and sometimes on the other. And I think this alone accounts for just 90% of the disparity between what games scare people and what games try to be scary but aren't and games that don't try to be scary but are and all that sort of thing. I just, I don't think people really analyze what is scary. Yeah, they're de you know, it's like, I mean, a lot of people, you just go up to someone and say, what's scary? Well, zombies, monsters, ghosts, things that are ugly, things that are nasty, things that are dark. You go to other people, Qu what's being scary? Being quiet, then jumping out and going boo. But yeah, you go to other people, what's scary? And they say, AIDS, the Holocaust. Yeah, those are scary. My, your mom. Your mom is pretty scary. Yeah, not as scary as your mom. Uh, but startling, I think, is one. But I think the much more interesting second kind, but the kind that is most often conflated with fear in general, is the mundane fear, the meta fear. Uh, I guess the example I have for this is, remember games like Final Fantasy, where you have to fight your way in and get the floater and fight your way out. And if you die or get lost or fuck up, you have to go through all that all over again because you couldn't save your game. Oh, that's true. I mean, games today, they don't really punish the player very much because, you know, that sort of makes the games very frustrating and no one likes them. So even a game that's supposed to be scary usually doesn't punish you. I mean, Resident Evil lets you save on the typewriters all over the place, right? So, I mean, if a game doesn't... I mean, even if a game isn't supposed to be scary, if the game has a serious punishment for failure then failure suddenly becomes very, very frightening if you know that there's that extreme punishment. But and at the same time, punishment and meta-fear are this almost logical, calculated, controlled fear. It's not like, it's not this visceral feeling. It's this very literal, I don't want to have to play through the part of the game that I just played again feeling. Mm. It's this calculated, oh my God, and... But I mean, While if you're I Mario liked... and you're, there's a big hole and you got to jump over it, you're actually afraid to fall down it. Whereas if you can just load it up again, you're not afraid to fall down it. You will just jump with no fear. But while you're afraid on this calculated meta level, you're not afraid on this human visceral level. You're not like imagining yourself as Mario fearing this bottomless chasm you have to jump over. You're, <laughs> no, not, no, you're, not, you're not trembling. No, you're, you're not. not. It's, it's this very meta fear. It's this... If you are, you need help. It's the, ah, shit. And I think the problem I had with Eternal Darkness was that it really only had these first two kinds of fear. It was primarily either boo or meta. And the meta was always either, you know, you walk into a room, you think you died, 
crap. Up, oh, no, I didn't die. Or I'm going to spoil because it, statute of limitations, seriously. The point near the end of the game where if your sanity meter gets low enough, you go to save your game, and then it's just like, uh, up. Oh, Format error, and then your save game disappears? Well, no, there was a part, I think, towards the middle-ish, late-ish part of the game where it popped up, like, the GameCube error message, like, oh, your game screwed up, and then it was like, aha, just kidding. Yep, but that scared me. It got me. I was like, what? Ah!" I wasn't scared. I was just pissed. I was like, oh, fuck. I wasn't like, oh, God, no. But that is fair, but it's the pure meta-logical fear. You don't have the visceral, like, you don't get that spine-tingling that, like, incomprehensible primal feeling of fear that that you're actually afraid and it doesn't have to be fear in the like ooh, but just that you know every now and then you're 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 all at least most of you human everyone has felt that kind of visceral you don't have any logical reason to be afraid the same feeling you have when like you're a kid and you're afraid of the dark there's there's no guy with a gun or even if there is a guy with a gun that's there's a logical fear of that but the the kind of primal, there is nothing to actually be afraid of, but you are having a physiological reaction. Your body feels this certain visceral primal urge to flee that you can't control. And even if you can control it, and you can still feel it. It's there. Mm-hmm. And people feel it to different degrees, and everyone has different kind of ways to deal with it, but it's there. It's, it's part of being an organism that reacts to stimuli in a solipsistic world and all that stuff, but... I feel like very few games ever have consciously tapped that. A lot of games have tapped it by accident. Like, I th- I do feel that Zelda 1 tapped it for some reason with Ganon's dungeon in the end. And I don't think it was intentional. I think a lot of it, def- I, the, I, it's like I try to figure out why, right? Because it's like, well, if I'm going to complain about Resident Evil and stuff not being scary, right? Why was Zelda 1 that last dungeon? Why was it scary? And you know what? It wasn't just the last dungeon. It was that whole northwest corner of the map was scary, you know? Um, or on a good example, Zelda 2, you know, keep going along the Zeldas. Zelda 2 is a pretty good game, and the the Hammer place had this meta fear of... Fuck, the I have hammer, to do the hammer place again. is pretty scary, yeah. But that was mostly meta. It was, fuck, I have to do this again. That took me like yeah. four hours. Mostly the game. As soon as you took the raft over to the other island, everything was scary. Uh, super scary all the time. It was almost like, and it wasn't. It wasn't strong fear. It wasn't the like you drop no, the controller. It like, wasn't. Ugh. It wasn't super strong, but it was constantly ever present. And it was real fear. It's the kind of fear that I was looking for that isn't in these other games it should be in. But it's still, it, it was weak. It was a very, it was like, there's this something, some aspect of the game, either by design or by chance, touched just briefly, just barely, infinitesimally, on some factor that causes primal fear in at least some humans. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't think of games, very few games that have done that. Yeah, there's there's not too many. But I, I we I've been trying to think about games that cause that feeling even for a second, and I realize that almost every case seems to either have something to do with the uncanny valley, like something just isn't quite right, or something is unpredictable in an unexpected way. Not not in the unpredictable, you know, the monster moves in this random pattern that I can't figure out. But like, if you're playing a game like Castlevania two, and The game glitches, and you end up in just this weird space in the game you can't get out. There's this this slight alien feeling that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how in the Uncanny Valley, where if something's fake enough, it doesn't bother you. If something's real enough, it doesn't bother you. If something's almost real, almost together, but it's just a little bit off... It's like humans are like on a hair trigger to feel something is wrong with that as a result. Yeah, it's like, and I, I try to think about like, you know, these games, like what was what was up with them, right? And, you know, there was the, the music and Zelda in the last level of Zelda 1 definitely was a, con- a contributor, right? The fact that the bad guys were really dangerous in, in Z- at the end of Zelda 1 and in the second half of Zelda 2, yep. that was a contributor. You but know. primarily on Metafear there. Yeah, yeah. Um... But, you know, also, if you look, all right, Zelda 2, right? When you're on that first island, think about the bad guys, right? You know, the, their staff losses, they look all right, you know. Um, moblins, they moblins, just walk. Moblins look just fine. Cute you know, little slimes. Cute little slimes that are, you know, perfectly rendered, right? You go to the other island, right? And first of all, the grass over there isn't 
clean, shiny grass. It sort of like got all this crap all over it. And like the bad guys, like you got those guys, like those bugs with the extending legs that bounce up and down. Yep. And like they're a little bit sort of shaky, right? And they're sort of pixely and not clearly defined. And then like a or lot those of those bees, those like weird bugs that just kind of come down yeah. and move in this really like weird methodical pattern that didn't fit the way a thing would fly. It was. There was a lot of Uncanny Valley kind of stuff going on there. Yeah, and then, like, you look at, um, like, some of the map areas. It's, like, the uh, in the second half, and it's, like, it just wasn't as well. It's, like, it felt like someone took real care in, like, you know, per, well, doing a really good design on that first half of the game. But the second half of the game, it feels like a lot of the design isn't so perfect. You know, like, for example, there's that spirally part in the mountains, right? But, like, one hallway is, is like, three wide, and another one's two wide. And it's, like, it's just sort of thrown together a little bit. And I think that it's just little things like that, things that you don't, you know, consciously notice. It's just... You know, it's the kind of thing where someone making a game today, you know, if you made one hallway wide and the other one's sort of narrow and it looks sort of broken like that, like it was just sort of, it look it looks like someone screwed up doing the art. You know, it doesn't look like it's supposed to be that way. It's like, hey, you fucked up, fix it, you know? Um, but I think that that sort of thing is actually contributes to, you know, the real fear on sort of like this, you know, subconscious level. I think part of it, and I, I feel strongly about this, is the idea that, a game that has uh, this sort of consistency and expectations. The world is created and defined, and it works around you in some way. And, like, in the first part of Zelda 2, everything is very clean and together and orderly, and there's roads between all the places, and you get this sort of comfortable feeling. You have expectations about what should be, and everything's in its place, and everything works. And then suddenly you're confronted with a place where that's not true. You've been lulled into the sense of security and expectations, and then one by one, all of those expectations are kind of pulled out from under you. Yeah, you've got nice, safe roads connecting all the towns. Two good examples. In Zelda 2 and in Dragon Warrior 1, you find eventually a place that should be one way that is very strongly not a town. In Zelda 2, there is a town that if you go into it, there are no people. There are just invisible monsters that kill you. Mm -hmm. But... Up until that point, in almost every game you played, not in just that game, but in all games like that, towns were the safe places where you go and save your game. It's like if in a Final Fantasy game, you go into the inn, you save your game. Go into the inn, save your game. One inn you go into, you go to save your game, and there's no one to save your game in that inn. There's just like a dead guy. Let me think. It could even be even simpler stuff than that, right? I mean, think about this, right? You know, you're playing, say, a Mario game, right? What color is a Goomba? It's it's brown with a white face and blue feet, right? Well, you go into it someplace. It's like well, you got like there's a black Goomba, you know. And I mean, if you portray the black Goomba, just you know, not as you know cute like it you know could be, but you could portray that Goomba in such a way, you know, someone comes in, it's like, oh shit, black Goomba. Now, if you just made the Goombas black in one level, that doesn't do it. Or no, if no. you if you build up to the Goomba, if you like I think partly it's the unexpected, the unexplained, and the nonsensical. If in one of the places there's just one black Goomba that's like all the other Goombas, it just looks different. And that's the only one, and there's no explanation, and you never run into it again, that triggers that feeling just a little bit. Yeah, a tiny bit. Just a tiny, tiny and Mario, bit. you know, doesn't have the design to, to, to do it so well, but, you know, it's that kind of idea. Or, like, I, I brought this up before, too, but I remember I read some article about how the key to making scary bosses or scary monsters in games is to make them be unpredictable in a visceral way or unpredictable in a way that isn't in and of itself predictable. Mm -hmm. That might sound dumb, but, like... Well, I mean, think about pretty much every boss has a pattern. Every single one. I mean, what or, boss doesn't have a pattern? Now, they can act randomly, but you sort of start to expect them to go in a certain way. But well, it, I mean, even if they're acting randomly, they're, sele they're randomly selecting from a set list of moves. So you know what moves they have. So it doesn't matter if they choose this move three times and then that move two times. You know what all the moves are, and they give signals as to what move they're about to do. Which, now, now I'm not saying the game shouldn't be that way, because for a game... Especially a Castlevania game. If you don't want a game to be scary, don't make it scary. Well, not only that, but if you don't make the bosses telegraph their moves, then it's basically just luck Impossible, and yeah. As opposed to half reaction, half puzzle. Exactly. But if you can make it unpredictable, like if, they, if, if every now and then things just go in a way that you can't possibly expect, 
not necessarily just to kill you, but just unexpected. Like if the monster turns away and regards something else or runs away from you inexplicably or just does something that takes you aback. That that's uh, that may, may not do it in and of itself, but I think that's on the road to bringing that feeling out. Mm. Just doing more things like that, you know, things that make you, you know, feel like, you know, oh shit, this, you know, I mean, you go into like different areas in a game, right? And it's like, okay, this is a different area. Okay, now I'm in a different area, right? But there's sort of like when you go to that last level in Zelda One, it's like there's that this is it feeling, you know? It's like that knowledge that this is it, and. A lot of games, I think, don't actually have the this is it because, you know, they keep coming on with the square bosses and stuff like that, right? Because it was like, you don't really know when you're at the end of the game. Well, you they do. If you've Sometimes already, you do. If you've already beaten the main boss, you know there's one more boss. That's true. <laughs> but I mean, you know, a lot of games don't do a very good job of being like, this is it. You know, they don't want to let you know that this is really, this part is the end part, you know? Uh, you but know, then look at like Castlevania 2. The, the, the right before, like the whole game is kind of consistent up to a point. Right before the end of the game, you get before Dracula's castle. There's a town like every other town, but the bricks are all gray, and you've never seen that before. And there's no one in the town. No one. You go into the church, all the buildings. No one. You find secret passages in some of the houses. Nothing in them. You go all the way down multiple levels. Sometimes in the secret passage, another secret passage. There's just nothing. In one of the houses, in the secret passage, you find one person sitting there by themselves, and all they say is, please stay with me. <laughs> and it's kind of creepy. So then you leave that town, and then next is this bridge, and then Dracula's castle. And when you go in, it plays music you've never heard before. You know, this, this is like the Castlevania theme. Yep. And there's nothing there. And for five minutes, you just walk and walk and walk down and down and down and down. There's nothing there. And then at the end, there's nothing. There's just an altar. You brought Dracula with you, and then you resurrect him in the basement. <laughs> that, again, that, I'm not going to try to say that that is scarier than Fatal Frame. I don't think it is. But what I think it does... It's also not a very good game. No, but I think that that game, because of its glitchiness and just that last bit, also goes down the road of what could be a viscerally scary game. Well, I mean, that's another thing is that glitchiness is scary, right? Metroid 1 has a lot of scariness going on just because of its glitchiness, you know? And I think that when you make a game, even if you try to make it scary with monsters and zombies and Cthulhu's and ghosts and boo and whatever you got in there, right? If You should make the game glitchy. But even like, you know, Eternal Darkness again with its insanity meter, right? Appearing to be glitchy. It's fake glitchiness. And people can tell. People can tell when it's real glitchiness and when it's fake glitchiness. And I don't think you can fake real glitchiness. I think you just need to make a glitchy-ass game to make it scary. And I, I have a lot of ideas. I feel like we should cut this short. We've already gone oh, on yeah, for a definitely. while. Oh, yeah, definitely. But I, I, we came up with, we were talking about this, I think we have a really good idea for what could be a scary game but yeah i definitely think one key though is don't polish the games don't do things that you're supposed to do don't make the graphic design consistent don't you know don't make the game well designed you know make it a little crappy in a few places well, because some of the scariest things are the things that leave a few glitches in there that aren't showstoppers that make the game actually break just you know? don't make sense at all and because things might not make sense from a realistic standpoint, but they make sense in the context of the game. Or, even if not in the game, in the context of video games. But if you have things that don't make sense in any of those contexts, they're just there. That's on the road again. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like... like, just, like, usually, like here's, an exa here's one example before uh, we cut this out, right? You know, usually, you know, there's the Chekhov's gun, Scooby-Doo type of thing, Right. You know, or like, you know, they'll put some some sort of graphic that you haven't seen anywhere else and it stands out from the background. So obviously it's supposed to do something or it's special in some way. But I mean, some so a lot of games, a lot of NES games in certain places, they would have things like that, but they wouldn't do anything. They would just be there. But then and you'd sit there trying to play with it or whatever. And like, depending on the game, though, it might sort of freak you out. Like you think it might do something. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but then, like, look at a lot of the scary games now where you walk by the window and you just, you know, something's going to jump through the window. Exactly. But then they switch it up and something jumps from behind the window. Oh, no. The window. Oh, no. But I guess in closing, the, the best thing I think you could do to make a scary game that I've never seen anyone really do is, one, have everything be well lit and not scary. Completely, you know, normal, well lit, mind defined, not, you know, Resident Evil y or Eternal Darkness. Not dark gray and brown. But two, you have to engender this false sense of security, this false set of expectations, this false set of, like, this false context for the world, and establish all these norms and guidelines and rules to where the person, like, things make sense in the game. And then one by one, after for a, after a while, you have to start pulling the rug out from under each and every one of these expectations. Mm -hmm. And video games can do this more so than a lot of other ways to scare people because the person, you know, as a human, you're looking at a 3D world. Say it's a first-person view game. You have all these expectations and meta context that you're bringing with you because you live in a 3D world and you see it in the first person. You expect things to work in a certain way. You could make... A house, a small house that is actually non-Euclidean in a video game. That you make four lefts and you don't end up where you started again. But yet it doesn't look like you did anything weird. Yeah, I mean, you know, think about, say, Resident Evil 1, right? In Resident Evil 1, you know, every door goes to where you think it goes. You know, I mean, you have a map. The map is correct. What if, like, you went in a door and you just ended up in some other room and then you went back through the door and you ended up in some other room, that th not the one you came from, and you're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> yep. But, you know, and the thing is, okay, if you do it all the time, then people are just like, oh, well, you know, I guess every door just takes me someplace random, whatever. What if you just did it once? Did it like once. And or... if you go back through the door, it never happens again. Yep. Ever. And you just, and you do things, a whole bunch of different things once each. But even then, because... So in general, the game is still playable, right? Because it's just, all, these weird things only happen once each, but... As a whole, those things combine to make the player very uneasy psychologically. But even then, there's the jarring disconnect, video game-wise, video game context when you go through a door. Going through a door is contextualized in video games as the expectation that there could be a teleportation, that you're moving to a different zone, that you're not in this one contiguous three-dimensional space. Mm. In a first-person continuous game without loading screens, you could do this within the same room, as in, I look to the right... I see, you know, a, a fireplace with a mantle over it and a portrait and like some candles on the on the on the mantle. And I kind of look away and I do something else and I look back in the course of doing my other thing and one of the candles is missing or it's lit or the portrait's slightly different. Not obvious things, just subtle disconnection, subtle decontextualization, subtle things that break your expectations but otherwise have no effect. Or that maybe will have an effect later. Like mm -hmm. you'll like maybe the portrait changed and you don't realize it. Later in the game, something happens that makes you realize way back that the portrait changed. Well, how about this, right? You walk into a room, right? It's a square room. You're facing north, right? On the north wall, you see the fireplace, right? You turn to face the east wall. There's a door. You turn to face the north wall. There's a door. You turn to face the west wall, there's a fireplace. The fireplace moves from the north wall but to Robert, the west wall. You can make it, and you then the fireplace just remains on the west wall forever. So it's like, was I really? Look, what? And you can, you can make uh, it The continuous. fireplace forever is now on the west wall. It never moves back to the north wall. I mean, you, things can be continuously and subtly disconcerting you. You can turn 90 degrees to the left, but that 90 degree turn takes 120 degrees worth of turning. Oh, you could do that. Yeah. You can do all sorts of things. Mm. And I, I just, I, we've got a lot more to say. We'll have to cut it short. We will talk about this topic again. Uh, I don't think we will. Well, not, not the overall, we're not going to do another show, spooky games, but we'll probably do more specific shows about some of the things we talked about. Maybe. I think we will. I will. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. 
We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.